So welcome everyone again to our fabulous Bradfield in Conversation. I'm Samantha Graham, President of Voices of Bradfield. And on behalf of the Executive Committee, Stuart, Carolyn, Gillian, Rob, Kate, and more recently Claire and myself, uh, plus our 60 or more members and all our volunteers who make possible what we do, um, we're again delighted to welcome you residents of Bradfield and those from further afield to Bradfield in Conversation. So we're an independent community organisation united by our shared purpose in returning respect, integrity and trust to politics. And we are, with growing urgency, building a voice in our democracy for the people of Bradfield. Now I wanted just to take a minute at this juncture um, to, in the evolution of Voices of Bradfield's um, sort of history to um, give a little summary of what we've been up to since we incorporated on April 28th. Um, just a quick overview to let you know where we've got to, um, partly because we just welcomed a new member onto the executive committee, uh, Claire, and um, so this was a time for us to take stock and see what we've, what we've managed to achieve. So we've built a web presence, it's now in its third iteration, um, the most recent version being funded and managed by a community member and volunteer who has specialist skills. And we're very, we're just absolutely chuffed with the new website. Um, we've engaged with over 800 residents through kitchen table conversations and online surveys about their main concerns, values and priorities with regard to federal politics. We've delivered nine newsletters. They come out fortnightly. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, she's been a total legend. She's having a drink, well-deserved drink. <laughs> um, and that's going out to our growing database of over 850 recipients. Then, um, We've, we've built an on the ground volunteer community of over 65 members who have delivered 50,000 plus flyers to all areas of the electorate in a very systematic and well coordinated way. And we've got some more um, in the print process now. And we've created a social presence, um, thanks to everybody in the team, except for me, I'm not very good on social media. Um, Twitter, we've got 2,500 followers. Um, Facebook, 360, we've got an open page and a closed page. Uh, the, the closed community Facebook page has 75 members on it. And um, Instagram, we've just kicked off and it's growing very well with 200, thanks to Kate. Um, we've run six online events, attracting hundreds of people. And uh, all of those can be found on our YouTube channel. Nicolette saying, website's fabulous, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the team have been busy. So we, it's an invitation to come and join us. We, there's a lot to do. And um, a, a number of you asked at the start, very start of the call how we're going with our candidate search. And we're um, just quietly saying we're, we're, we're very happy with how it's going. And uh, we'll, we'll give you news as it, as it happens. So uh, two things, just to let you know, we are recording this. And um, secondly, I'd like to hand over to Gillian Gillian King for the acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Gillian. Thanks, Sam. That's all right. This meeting is hosted by Voices of Bradfield on the sandstone country of the Daramurugal and Guringai clans. They met here for thousands of years to share news, family and culture. At night, they looked up to the familiar skies and maybe they told the stories of the stars. We follow in their footsteps and we acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians and elders of the Daramurugal clan and the Guringai clan and the continuation of cultural, spiritual and education practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples. We continue our journey of listening and work towards true kinship and equality under the eternal stars. Thanks, Gillian. Thank you Thanks, so much. Gillian. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> just to get us thinking about people we may know in uh, Bradfield. I'm going to show you this map of Bradfield. 
stretching from Castle Cove down the bottom right up through the whole train line, Roseville, Kalara, Pimble, etc., up to North Taramara, Asquith, Waitara. And I just thought it might be nice to, to think about who, who we know in the, in the, in the electorate, uh, whether it's to uh, get them involved as volunteers or on the ground or um, in, in whatever other capacity. We're, we're always looking for people with different skill sets to help. So um, that's where we are, as you all well know. So now, with no further ado, I would love to introduce our two speakers for the evening. Um, we've been really looking forward to this, this talk. It it's, feels like a, a privilege to have these two gentlemen on uh, Voices of Bradfield in conversation with us because of their expertise over many, many years, um, dare I say, on both sides of the fence, if you like. So Freddie Sharp, for more than two decades, has been at the forefront of the fight against climate change building and growing new businesses, advocating for new and effective policy, and directly reducing carbon emissions by tens of millions of tonnes. He's a director of Climate Friendly, Australia's leading developer of carbon projects, which he founded and led for 13 years as CEO, and which is on target to reduce emissions by 100 million tonnes by 2025. So Freddie, welcome. Thank you, Sarah. And Ian has Ian Dunlop has spent 30 years in the fossil fuel industry, drilling holes around the world in search of oil and gas, then briefly as chair of the Australian Coal Association. He reversed direction in the early 1990s and has been a vocal climate change advocate ever since. He's a member of the Club of Rome, which produced the Limits to Growth report in 1972. In his view, this remains one of the most accurate pathfinders for the global future. It was indeed an extraordinary document. Um, thank you, Ian, also for being here. So, great. Uh, we, you know where the, where the clapping buttons are down the bottom in reactions and you're very welcome to put questions in the chat. And we've got a, a, about one hour of questions that I'm going to put to Freddie and Ian and then we'll open up to your questions. So thank you everyone for being here. Just to reiterate, I'm sorry if there was some, some uh, strangeness with the link, but um, it's great you're here with us. So look, the first question I wanted to pose was looking at the organisations you've, you've founded, starting with, um, you know, what, what your role is um, in those organisations. Describe of us what their intentions and purpose are and the broad arc of how you came to create these organisations. And this will give us a little bit about each of you, why those vehicles and what, what needs they fulfil. So who'd, who'd like to start on that one? I'm happy to go first time if that helps. Great, Freddie. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Sam, for that lovely introduction, which I think I wrote, so it was really very flattering. Thank you. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> um, and thank you, everyone, for turning up tonight on what is um, going to be hopefully a great discussion. Look forward to lots of questions. It's at a critical time uh, for climate change policy and a critical time in regard to an impending election, which is why we're all here, of course. Let me just give you a little bit about myself. I'm going to kick off, Sam, with a very public confession and a mayor culpa. My first degree back in 1981 was in geology. And my first real job after university, I was a well-sighted geologist on oil rigs in the North Sea, drilling for oil and gas and saying in effect to the world, hey, these fossil fuels are really cool. Let's keep burning them. So I think it's fair to say there's been a dramatic U-turn in my worldview in the last 40 years as to what we should do about fossil fuels. And without dobbing in Ian too prematurely, I think we overlapped on the oil rigs back in the day. Ian, of course, was an engineer, and engineers are very smart compared to geologists. They're really scientific. Uh, geologists are more intuitive, I think. We like to think of ourselves as the interpretive dancers of the science community. Anyway, enough about our history. The, uh, the last 20 years I've spent building um, companies, which I enjoy, enjoy doing. I love small companies, I love startup companies. They can really make an impact very, very quickly. And they can do things that bigger companies um, aren't willing or able to do. And the, uh, the last 15 years, as Sam said, I've spent um, running and owning uh, Climate Friendly, which is now Australia's largest developer of land-based carbon projects. Um, we uh, style ourselves, and we have done from the very first days of the company, as a, a profit for purpose enterprise. And both of those are equally important. The purpose of Climate Friendly is to reduce the impact of climate change globally. And we quantify that purpose 
to uh, targets in the millions of tons of carbon that we can directly uh, reduce or prevent from being emitted. Um, and the purpose of the profit side of the company is a measure of how successful we are at achieving our purpose. The more success we have, the more profit we make, the more we reinvest in the company and the greater the impact we can generate. And as Sam said in the introduction, our current near-term target for the company is to reduce emissions or capture carbon equal to 100 million tons by 2025, mid this decade. Uh, and as of last year, our previous target was 20 million tons. By the end of 2020, we, uh, we achieved that comfortably. And when you consider that country, our uh, national emissions as an economy are about 500 million tons, it's not immaterial, but it's not nearly enough. But the great news is there's plenty of upside. Um, the reason we work in the land sector is because it's the greatest way to sequester carbon on the planet. We don't need to build new machines to capture CO2. We rely upon a, a well-established process called photosynthesis and machines called vegetation. Um, about 12 years ago, in 2009, I think, CSIRO put out a report with the Queensland government saying that um, in their view, they estimated we could reduce emissions, we could sequester in the landscape in Australia, over a billion tons of emissions a year for 20 or 30 years, and not get close to the levels of carbon that existed before European settlement. And since European settlement, we've lost about 50 to 70% of our carbon from the landscape in Australia due to uh, inappropriate, not malicious, but inappropriate land management practices. So carbon farming and land-based projects simply work with landholders to change the way they manage their land uh, such that it either reduces emissions from the land or captures emissions in the atmosphere. And at the same time, the win-win uh, angle is that it makes their land more productive. More soil carbon equals better drought resistance and water retention, more above ground biomass allows for productivity and cropping and livestock management, uh, the list goes on. And the reason the land sector is crucial, and I'll wrap up in a second, Sam, is um, if as a planet we stopped burning fossil fuels tomorrow, which is probably a little bit unlikely, but hopefully not too long after that, we are still have in the atmosphere dangerously high levels of atmospheric CO2. And they need to be drawn down from the atmosphere very, very quickly. Um, and the land sector, I think globally, is the greatest opportunity to do that uh, with well-proven methods and technologies and at the scale and the speed required. So I think it's rather exciting. And later on, I'll talk to you about how big this could become in Australia in terms of emission reductions. That might be enough to kick off, Sam. Wonderful, thanks so much, Freddie. Ian, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sam. <clears throat> well, I've got, um, I suppose, three organisations I'm linked with at the moment. Um, perhaps start closest to home. Um, we, I'm involved in a little organisation called the Breakthrough National Centre for Climate Restoration which has been running for about 15, 16 years now. And its main focus has been the view that we badly underestimated the speed of climate change. Uh, it is actually escalating far faster than we expected, and certainly much faster than the official view, both from international bodies like the IPCC, and certainly our own um, organizations here in Australia. Now, those views are changing as we see the impacts. Um, it's clear now the IPCC came out with this report um, in August, which is the probably the most definitive statement they've made on the fact that things are now moving unequivocally. Uh, climate change is happening, it's accelerating and so on. Uh, we've been arguing for at least a decade that we now have to move to some genuine form of emergency response which I'll talk about a bit later, but I think is where we will actually end up. Um, so that's been a focus of mine now for well, 15 years or so. The um, second organization that spun off that is the question of security. Uh, and an organization called the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group, which was formed earlier this year of um, former senior military and intelligence uh, people who are essentially concerned about the same thing, but coming at it from a military perspective that this country is not prepared for what is going to get thrown at us 
inevitably now in the next uh, few decades. And the urgent need to actually rethink the way we're actually managing risk. And then the third organization um, I'm involved in is the Club of Rome, which you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the Club of Rome was formed in 1968 by an Italian industrialist and a Scottish scientist concerned about the fact that if we kept uh, expanding population exponentially and expanding consumption the same way, we would end up hitting the limits of the planet, uh, which are finite, notwithstanding alternative views around the place. That's the way it's turning out. And therefore, we should think um, really about how we wanted to manage that process, because if we didn't, we would end up in considerable problems. Now, in the end, we decided not to manage that process, and we now are ending up in considerable problems. Climate change is only one of them. So I'll touch on that a little bit later, but um, that's where I guess the three groups I'm essentially coming from. And it stems really from an early interest I had in long-term uh, energy issues and development issues, plus the fact that um, in drilling for oil wells around the world, including in the North Sea, you run across the problem of risk in no uncertain terms, particularly if you're just starting those sort of things. Um, so I've been following that sort of path really for my entire career. And now we end up in climate change. So I'll probably leave it at that for starters. <clears throat> Fantastic, Ian. That's a great a great segue into just that whole framework of, of viewing the the crisis through the lens of risk, which is where we're where we're going this evening. So, speak speak to us about the heart of the conversation tonight, the opportunities and risks um, that, that the climate crisis presents us with. This we decided very consciously to start actually with Ian and then go to Freddie because this will be dark followed by light. Uh, we hope. Um, so over to you, Ian, if you, uh, did you want to sh share your slide deck at this stage? Yes, I'll do that. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, um, if you can all see that, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to just talk now about what the realities of climate change really are as, uh, as I see it. And that has to start with a question of what is the physical reality? Because if political reality is not grounded in that, then as John Schellenhuber says, it's completely useless. So what I'll talk about is first, what is that reality? Second, what's been the policy response thus far? And then what do we really require? And all this is hinged off the question of the Paris Climate Agreement, which as you remember, uh, said that we're aiming to keep temperatures, global temperatures below two degrees in as close as we possibly can to one and a half. Um, that's sort of getting missed in the Glasgow discussion, I think, but that's actually where we decided we wanted to go. Mm. So if you look at the science then, um, my perspective on this, and it's borne out, I think now by the IPCC and many, top scientists around the world is that we're going to hit one and a half inevitably now by by before 2030 irrespective of whatever action we take in the meantime it's likely that two two degrees will occur before 2050 even if we take action better than the current the paris agreement uh, conditions before glasgow um three will hit in the early to mid second half of the century and it's quite possible we'll hit five before 2100 unless we really start doing some pretty substantial things very quickly. The problem we've got is that whatever we do is not going to make a big difference over the next 20 to 25 years due to the fact that if you cut, air, cut emissions, you have the offsetting effect of getting rid of aerosols as you clean up the atmosphere. Now, at the moment, those aerosols come from burning coal and oil. They sit in the atmosphere and they actually cool the planet relative to what might otherwise happen. So as you clean up the atmosphere, those aerosols go and you get an offsetting warming effect because of that. What we know is the um, current 1.2 of warming is already dangerous. You're seeing that around the world in the impacts um, we've seen here. Uh, you see in particularly in the Northern Hemisphere in the last summer. 
We know two is going to be extremely dangerous, three would be catastrophic, and four would be basically unlivable for most people. And in Australia, well, land these are average global temperatures. I mean, land temperatures are actually higher than that. And we were already at one and a half in 2019. And the, the final point on here is that we are now heading toward the risk of what are termed the hothouse earth conditions, where you get nonlinear feedbacks uh, being triggered within the climate system because of increased um, emission con uh, carbon concentrations, which may lead to irreversible and self-sustaining warming. And some of that may actually um, result in tipping points being triggered and there is a view that uh, some of these actually are already um, at that point. What are they? Well, if you look around the world, um, about 15 of them were identified oh, more than a decade ago now, 2009. 2009. And there are these sort of areas, um, the Arctic sea ice, Greenland, boreal forests in North America, the permafrost and so on. Um, if you go through those, there's evidence that the Arctic sea ice has already tipped uh, the West Antarctic ice and uh, some of the coral reef areas of the Great Barrier Reef, which means that we cannot turn back now, it's too late. It won't mean that we necessarily see the disappearance of these things straight away, but over time, that is probably what is now locked in. And those changes don't stay where they are, they make big changes around the world. If you look at um, other ones, there's growing evidence. You're seeing the same thing with the Greenland ice sheet, the thermoaline circulation in the North Atlantic and the Amazon, which may be turning from a carbon sink into a carbon source. And the same in the um, East Antarctic um, uh, ice sheets as well. And beyond that, you've then got evidence of change in the permafrost in um, Siberia around the Arctic and in the boreal forests in North America. So these things are real, they're, they're starting to happen. The problem we have is we have to move extremely quickly to stop them getting away from us. Uh, <clears throat> we may have lost control of one or two, but that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't stop the others uh, you know, getting away from us too. So that's the urgency of the problem. And the IPCC finally started to talk about this in the report last August. Before that, they, did, they ignored it because they didn't have enough information, which at one level is sensible uh, scientifically, but at another level from a risk management point of view is actually completely nonsensical because they are the big threats. Mm. If get away from it, it's game over. So what are the policy implications of that? Well, it means that the um, magical figure of net zero by 2050 is totally inadequate. I mean, it's 30 years away. It's just kicking the can down the road. We've had 30 years of doing nothing. The thought that you can do it again for another 30 years is nonsense. We've got to get to that point as soon as possible, ideally by around 2030, with increasing numbers of people are talking about. Um, now, that's not going to be easy for reasons I'll come to. Um, the government's first priority to their, their people should be their security and prosperity. I mean, climate change is now the greatest threat to that secure future. And the threat to now, it's not uh, years ahead. You can't wait any longer. The reason for that is the climate system has an inertia that whatever you do today, you don't see the results of for 10, 20, 30 years ahead. So the reason we're seeing problems today is because of the emissions we put up there you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. So what we're doing now is locking stuff in that is going to escalate those impacts quite dramatically in the year ahead because what we're seeing is an acceleration of them. So the priority now is we can't avoid that happening. What we've got to do is to stop that as becoming far worse. And uh, um, another element of this is, as Freddie said, is we've got to pull down the atmospheric carbon concentrations from 500 parts per million um, CO2e at the moment to a more stable level, about 350. Now, this is something that's not even talked about in this country. You don't see it in the plan. You don't see it in the scientific discussions very much. But it is an essential component of what has to be done. 
but the technology to do it is in its infancy. Um, I mean, you you know, solar carbon and so on are critical to that, but we're going to have to move that to a scale that we've never seen before. And so we have an even greater risk in actually um, trying to do that. I know I have one more thought, sorry. Um, <clears throat> essentially point in there that um, you may have to resort to geoengineering to slow this warming process down, which is the last thing that people want to do, but there are no serious efforts being made in uh, various uh, establishments around the world to look at ways and means of, for example, slowing down the melt in the Arctic in a very localized sense, um, because we may well just have run out of time. We don't have very much choice but to try and do it. So what's the response in policy terms? Well, if you look here, well, of course, we know where we started. Um, we've had the IEA come out uh, for the first time ever in May this year and say, look, uh, we have a path to get to net zero, but it means there can be no more new oil, gas and coal production. We really have to cut back from today, not in five or 10 years time. Um, and that's the first time the I, International Energy Agency have ever said that. They've been very much on the side of the fossil fuel industry until uh, really this year, pretty much. Then, of course, we had uh, the national argument, and then we got to the plan. So the question is, what is that plan going to do for us? And really, you're back to unreality. I mean, you know, what we're saying is that we can deliver net zero emissions by 2050, essentially using, you know, yet to be uh, determined technology or proven technologies at scale with no clear priorities, no cost to Australians, no loss of jobs. Uh, frankly, that is, you know, cloud cuckoo land. In other words, it's business as usual with no social impact. And one of the most critical parts of this is not going to be technology. It's going to be the social change that has to go with it in terms of the way we live, the sustainability of the um, way in which we, we live in cities and urban areas across, really across the entire community. The problem with a plan is it has no objective apart from this net zero objective, which has really been plucked out of the air. Um, if you're going to have a plan, you've got to look at what the risks and opportunities are on the particular issue you're concerned about. And that is the essential base on which the uh, targets and the plan has to be developed. Now, we've never done that assessment in this country because of the toxicity of the political debate on both sides of the politics. We've never got around to doing it. And it means that the plan is largely worthless unless you actually uh, go ahead and do that properly. The other problem is that it breaks pretty much every principle in the Paris Agreement to which we signed on. Um, we are not trying to reduce emissions. We are not reducing the use of fossil fuels. We have tried every trick in the book to ease our pathway to fit in with what supposedly those commitments are. The commitments themselves are way below the appropriate level for Australia in a global context and so on. I won't sort of go through a lot of it, but you know, there's a long, long list in this. Um, but behind it all, uh, the real problem is that if you look at the components of it and what is being talked about in the deal that's come through with the nationals and so on, this is actually a smokescreen to allow the continuate, not just the continuation, but a massive expansion in the use of fossil fuels in coal and gas and the emissions that go with that when we really should be reducing emissions rapidly. And I mean, the argument seems to be going that uh, once that stuff leaves our shores, it's not our problem. It's the problem of the consuming country, which under the UN rules is actually correct. But that's, we've gone past that point. The fact is that um, climate change is a global issue. Wherever you put those, those emissions into the atmosphere, it comes back to bite us and everybody else. We are now at such a critical point that we cannot, we really cannot afford to do that. It is totally irresponsible to um, move in that direction. 
And the further problem is that we're the, one of the countries most exposed to um, climate change, whether it be in rural or urban communities. So what you come back to is that the failure to seriously address climate change is the greatest threat to the security of uh, present and future generations of Australians. It's far greater than China or the question of the lack of submarines and all the other popular things that we're currently talking about. So that's why our security group was getting extremely concerned about the lack of preparedness and the implications of this. And we put out this report, Missing in Action, uh, in September, which is now we're discussing with a whole range of people across the community. But the, the really fundamental point about it is that we are totally unprepared for the impacts of climate, which are now being locked in. Just as we were unprepared for the bushfires and the pandemic, and frankly, that's no longer acceptable. I mean, we know, we knew the pandemics were coming. We also knew they're linked to climate change, um, but we did nothing about it. And Australia generally has a history of being extremely good at reacting to events as they occur, as we did in the bushfires, but a very poor history of preparing to avoid the things that are going to be inevitably thrown at us. And that we cannot afford to do uh, with climate change. It's a completely different level of risk. It's an existential threat. So what do we do? Well, um, the societies that have been successful in overcoming the pandemic have done so by making it the absolutely top priority, as you've seen in the last year and year and a half or so, which is based on the best, based available science. I mean, climate is a much bigger threat. It requires exactly the same. But it's not just another item on the political agenda just to be boxed and diced as we've seen as normal. This is an existential threat of a kind that we have never, ever been faced with before, greater than the sort of thing that occurs in you know, world wars. And we have to look at it, not just from a local level, but also in a global context. So the um, critical issues now, you've got to assess those risks with brutal honesty. You've got to accept that we are now facing disruption, which is going to accord, require emergency mobilization, a bit akin to wartime. We have to act extremely fast. Uh, we must stop all fossil fuel expansion and rapidly reduce um, fossil fuel use. We have to uh, build the capacity to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And we're going to have to research uh, geoengineering possibilities. Now, obviously, those are not just things Australia has to do. This is a global problem. We need the maximum levels of global cooperation. Uh, we don't need a great deal of discussion on more sophisticated ways of killing one another. It's not greatly going to help us. So what we've now got, though, is the fact that technology's moved on. We have a whole host of solutions which we didn't have even a couple of years ago, uh, which offer enormous benefits, um, both socially and economically, as well as getting on, on top of climate. But we've got to stop this continual denial and pretense that somehow we can just skirt around the problem and it's business as usual, which is really what we're currently doing with the latest plan. So I'll just leave it there, I think, uh, but just a final comment from Sir David King, who used to be the Chief UK, uh, climate advisor, and we do a lot of work with him. There's much discussion on how much carbon budget there is left to burn. There isn't any. We've burnt it all far too much already. We need to go into reverse. And what we do in the next three to five years is going to determine the future of humanity. That's the urgency with which we have to move this forward. And it does need a complete rethink on the way we're going about this and a preparedness to cross that threshold and accept that that's the challenge. Uh, it's not going to go away. Uh, we now have to marshal all the forces we can to uh, get on top of it, and particularly from the community perspective. So I'll leave it there, Sam, at this point. Oh, thank you so much. It's just so sobering in one's face, and, and it just has to be said. It has to be put right in front of us like that, you know, look at this see this and um and unless we do that um we, we just don't understand the gravity of it so i'm sorry that that's your role at this um at this point in the planet's history but i really thank you for it Anne. yeah
So let's move swiftly to Freddie and hope he has the answers. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Freddie. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. No pressure at all. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Thank you. Um, I must say, well done, Sam, on scheduling this event for the middle of COP26. It was perfect timing. I know it was a detailed and cunning plan. Um, and it is really opportune because climate change, as Ian has pointed out, uh, is an existential threat. And it is front and center around the world at the moment. And sadly, taking a very parochial Australian perspective, we are yet again being shown up to be a laggard. And that's the issue that we can fix. I think I've labeled this little part of the discussion, climate change policy brackets in Australia, let's fix this. And not only because we have to fix this, of course, but because we can fix this. Um, everybody on this call, everybody in Bradfield, everybody in Australia is going to vote in an election in the next four to five months. And that gives us a chance to elect a parliament that is actually going to set ambitious targets for climate change policy and enact plausible, credible and forceful policies to get there and then work with business and community to achieve those goals. Um, all elections are critical. Every time we go to election, we told this most important election ever, but this one that may not actually be hyperbole. Uh, this is a chance for us to fundamentally change how we interact with our environment, uh, to fundamentally change uh, our role globally in playing our part in fixing a global crisis, as Ian pointed out, CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions, no, no national boundaries. But much more importantly, arguably in the short term, it's an opportunity not to miss out on the most radical economic transformation the world will ever see. The move, the transition to zero carbon uh, and zero carbon energy and industry is going to be extraordinary in terms of wealth generation, job generation, economic support, and our ability to fund the changes required to bring emissions down to zero and below. And it would be criminal if we were to exclude ourselves from that because we don't have a good climate change policy. Um, so how do we do that? I hear Sam asking me. If the premise is, and it certainly is, that in Australia, particularly, we need climate change policies that are very strong and robust with ambitious targets and delivering action on the ground through policies, then there's three ways to look at that. And I want to run through those three prisms quite quickly. The risks. Thanks to Ian, we know what the risks of climate change are, the economic, environmental, social, community, national security, healthcare risks, bushfire risk, drought risks. But we sometimes forget to work out or revisit why they exist. And this is a very quick chance to gallop through Climate Change Science 101, which many of you on the call, I have no doubt, are fully across, but not everybody is. And I want to pick out two or three sound bites from the scientific um, basis of man-made climate change to socialize and put into public debate. When you talk to your family, your friends, your neighbors, complete strangers, we need to rebut some of the nonsense that we keep hearing even after 20 or 30 years of this level of scientific knowledge. So let's just unpick or pick out a few sound bites to keep air in our back pocket. Much more the fun part of this presentation is the opportunities. And um, they are enormous, put it politely. We need, of course, the two biggest actors we have in our countries to work together, the private sector and the public sector. Public sector is the government and regulators nationally and internationally, putting in place the right policies, reducing uncertainty because investment does not thrive in uncertainty. First of all, can manage risk. They don't like managing uncertainty. You need consistent uh, policies that reduce uncertainty. And that enables the private sector, investors, businesses, consumers, communities, citizens, to do what they're very good at, which is delivering the outcomes that the policy sets as a target. And all things are possible when those two elements work together, and we have engagement with the public sector and good leadership, and we have the private sector doing what it does best, which is managing risks and delivering outcomes. And under the radar screen in Australia, we have one of the world's most successful examples of those two forces combining. Carbon farming in Australia has been a bipartisan policy position by both major parties for 10 years, and uh, not many people know about it. I'm sure on the call, a lot of you do but it's hugely successful. 
And that success now gives it a platform to become actually a uh, transformational enterprise, a transformational opportunity to reduce emissions in Australia at enormous scale quite quickly. How do we get those opportunities? The next steps, this, tonight's purpose is all about making sure we select and elect an independent member for Bradfield to be one of a cohort of independents who are informed and determined and single-minded and will push ambitious climate goals and will enact and deliver strong climate policies. If this seems quite likely as a minority government at the next election, and there are a number of in, in MPs focusing on climate change risk the way we want them to do, the leverage they will have in that parliament is extraordinary. And they can do whatever they, it takes to get across the line the, uh, the outcomes that we know we need for the reasons Ian's mentioned. But let me quickly get up through um, Climate Change Science 101 and just pick up two or three talking points, uh, which we should share with our, our friends and family and neighbours and strangers. And there's only one chart we need to look at to understand climate change science, and this is it. I'm sure you've all been familiar with this over the years. It, it got a bit of a star role in the Al Gore movie in 2006, uh, Inconvenient Truth. This is data, temperature uh, in the blue line below and CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere in the red line above. And this data goes back from the Vostok ice core in Antarctica, takes us back over nearly half a million years, well over 400,000 years of data. And we've got other ice cores and research which goes back over a million years and beyond. But the trends are very consistent and the measures are very, very simple. Now, as you can see from the go get CO2 and, and temperature march in lockstep, which makes perfect sense. We all know the physics and the science, but the trends talk about here are really intriguing. And the first thing to say is that many climate change skeptics are absolutely right that climate change has always happened. If you look at the temperature chart on the bottom and the CO2 chart on the top, it's a very dynamic system. But those changes and what the skeptics miss, the changes take far longer to go up in temperature and come down compared to human life scale, human um, lifetimes, they go very, very slowly. The fastest temperature increase in this period took 10,000 years to, to rise about uh, 10 degrees. And they take many, many years more to slow down. So, and well, none of these changes historically are man-made. These are all natural, naturally occurring. We think in large part meant to our orbit around the sun. But the fact is it's dynamic, it does change. So the rebuttal to the skeptics is, sure, it's changed in the past, but never this quickly. The second point I think we should highlight is that the CO2 range has been very tightly defined the last 400,000 years and beyond. It's never gone below 180 parts per million, never gone above 280 parts per million. So that's a naturally occurring range. It's a very stable, dynamic but stable system. And that's a really important point to make. Um, the third point I'd highlight is in the bottom temperature chart at the extreme right hand end, there's a 10,000 year period of unique, stable and temperate climate. For the last 10,000 years, it's been uniquely stable and temperate. And that, of course, is the 10,000 years in which humanity, Homo sapiens, the wise human, has flourished. And part of that flourishing, which has brought with it amazing success in technology and creativity and, and forms of governance and societal structures, that is a bit of a worry, is that we learned about 100 and 250 years ago how to access and harness and unleash vast amounts of cheap, bountiful energy in the form of burning fossil fuels. So that all looks fine, but it isn't really fine because as we know, we are now at 414 parts per million and climbing rapidly. We've smashed out of that trading range of carbon Never before in history has so much CO2 been added to the atmosphere so quickly. And it's entirely man-made, entirely anthropogenic. And that is the issue we're facing because we're already seeing, as you would anticipate, temperature beginning to rise and follow the CO2 levels. And that is the underpinning in a nutshell of all the climate change science, telling us what is causing the risks we are now seeing around the planet. So having said all that, and I'm sure many of you, but not all of you know these charts, what do we do about that? Now, in a sane and rational world, we would have been scrambling for the last four decades since the 
uh, the Club of Rome, Send Silent Spring by Rachel Carson to undo the impacts, to change the way we interact with our planet and with our environment. And to get that done successfully, very quickly, I think I've mentioned this already, you need the two great engines of change, the private sector and the public sector. And the private sector first can deliver the targets that we know we need, but they must be put in place by the public sector through government because capital without guidelines, without targets, without pathways, without clear goals, without information and data, and without checking uh, may not be as efficiently deployed as we would like. In fact, most capital is risk averse and the uncertainty about not having a goal, the uncertainty about not having guidelines and pathways means that it's too risky to invest, particularly in the Australian market right now. We even heard the treasurer, uh, Mr. Frydenberg, a month or so ago, deliver a speech which he highlighted the risks of us missing out on this tsunami of global capital because we don't have clear policies in place for achieving climate change. And what was very interesting is that uh, Matt Canavan, the, the Nationals uh, Senator, suggested that if the price of not destroying the coal industry was to pay a bit more on our mortgage because of interest rates on expensive finance, that's the price we should pay. Now that sounds to me like a carbon tax. To keep the coal industry alive, we should all pay more on our, on our mortgage. I think the inconsistencies between messages and realities are quite disturbing. So globally and locally and nationally, we need the public sector, governments and regulators put in place goals, policies and provide certainty. And then step back and let the private sector do what it does very, very well. Deliver the solutions, the products and services, the business models, drive us into uh, clean energy, clean manufacturing, clean industry, clean transport, clean consumption, manage the risk, and let's work our way towards what Ross Garno calls being the economic or environmental superpower in the 21st century. We have such superb resources for a clean renewable energy that we should be a global superpower in leading this transition and getting the economic benefits of that transition as well as the environmental goals we want. Now, the really good news is that this is happening. It's actually happening in Australia, which is, is quite staggering. Uh, in the land sector, carbon farming in a nutshell is asking uh, landowners to change the way they manage their land to reduce emissions, increase sequestration. And as we said earlier, it generally increases productivity and drag resistance and all the other benefits. Um, under the CFI legislation, the Carbon Farming Initiative, that was passed in 2011 under the Gillard government, um, farmers, landholders, foresters, uh, traditional owners are allowed to follow certain prescribed methods, which are prescribed in great detail. You don't rely upon people's goodwill. You have a very detailed method to apply to be it soil carbon or managing native vegetation or managing livestock. And if you do everything in the method, and then your projects pass muster at audit and issuance dates, you'll be granted carbon credits, uh, Australian carbon credit units, ACCI as they're called. But from the outset, and in the last 10 years that's been going, this scheme is recognized now globally as world's best practice for the integrity of a carbon scheme. Because carbon markets don't emerge spontaneously from the cut and thrust of capitalism. They are brought into being by policymakers and they need to be trustworthy and credible with great integrity so that these are genuine reductions in emissions or genuine capturing of CO2 from the atmosphere. And with the, the regulatory structure we have, the fact that the regulator and the government draft the methods, not industry or the landholders, with the requirement for auditing these projects and the compliance checks built into every single method, we have world's best practice, which we can export in managing the land sector for carbon uh, sequestration. And the unique thing about this is it's had bipartisan support from both major parties since it was put into place uh, and ever since the Abbott government succeeded the, uh, the Gillard government. And the main reason for that is that to both parties, benefits flow to rural and regional communities and farmers and landowners. And they're a key constituency, particularly for the nationals in the coalition, but for both parties. And as the benefits of this flow to those communities, it would have been very dangerous indeed to turn off the program because these communities are deeply conservative. I've spent 
10 years persuading farmers to adopt new land management practices. And I'm a, I'm a Sydney-based Englishman with a degree in geology. So their cynicism is quite pronounced. But as it works, and when the money flows, they get really excited. To turn that off, they would never have trusted again a program to reduce emissions in the land sector. The only change in the policy, I'm most conscious of time, yeah, mm -hmm. um, which is different, was that under the original um, structure, it was a polluter pays model, where, uh, uh, whereby uh, the polluters under an emissions trading scheme had to reduce emissions. Uh, to the extent they couldn't reduce emissions, they could buy um, um, excess permits from other polluters, or they'd buy carbon credits up to a certain limit. I think it was 10 or 15%. So the polluters paid for these carbon credits and that money flowed back through to landholders who were generating the activities that, redu that uh, reduced emissions. Under the, uh, the uh, Tony Abbott government, that became a taxpayer funded model as the rest of the ETS was dismantled, as we know. And there was a $2.5 billion uh, taxpayer fund, which continued to buy those credits from landholders on a, a 10 year contract basis. So apart from that bizarre reality that a free marketeer liberal government put in place a taxpayer solution and the Labour Party put in place a market solution, it's had bipartisan support. And the success is extraordinary. Over 1,000 projects registered across Australia since the first project registered back in 2012-2013. Over 200 million tonnes of emission reductions contracted to date from those projects. And $2.6 billion dollars has flowed and will continue to flow to rural, regional, remote and indigenous communities. Now those emission reductions are contracted over 10 years. 10 year contracts and they're, they're bought by the government at auctions about twice a year. So some of that still has to be delivered. About one third has been delivered to date and two thirds will be delivered in the remaining period of those contracts. Now what's fascinating and where these business models are morphing into one another, taxpayer pays, polluter pays, is there's now growing demand from voluntary buyers corporate buyers in particular, but also individuals, mums and dads and families and tourists and travellers to buy offsets, domestic offsets in Australia, which are very high quality and very reliable. And partly that's because the compliance companies, the corporates who will be under a future compliance market, even though right now the safeguard mechanism is very soft, doesn't really put any onerous requirements on these big companies who are polluting, they know one day they'll be captured by a more rigorous uh, compliance market. And they're buying offsets now to surrender in the future against their compliance obligations. And what that's mean is we've decoupled the carbon price in Australia from the government contracted price, which if you do the math is about $13 a ton, $2.6 billion to buy 200 million tons of emission reductions. And the spot market price is now over $30. That demand is chasing limited supply. And the really key point there is the uh, tax versus technology argument is interesting because under the government, um, the coalition government since 2013, we've had an explicit carbon price in Australia. There's a government funded, government legislated program that buys carbon credits from landowners at a fixed price per ton, which is a carbon price. Anyway, the ironies multiply. The uh, last couple of points to make on this slide is that as the market matures, there's now a very mature domestic market, two and a half billion dollars in the market. A lot of players coming into the market to um, uh, get exposure and experience. We're now seeing investors, both domestic and overseas, buying companies in this domestic carbon market to access the expertise that this sector has built up under the radar screen for over a decade. There's huge global interest in the ability to export these ideas and principles to other markets around the world. And under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, we are looking to build bilateral and multilateral arrangements with other countries to link markets. And the, the expertise we have in Australia is so exportable and the quality of the scheme is so high that there's a huge opportunity to bring that expertise to the world from Australia. And as a result of um, the uh, growing demand, the demand for these ACUs is now outstripping supply, which leaves yet another example of businesses and government working together. There's been a program for the last two years to try and increase supply of ACUs. So we avoid the price spikes because the companies who have to buy these ACUs would rather be able to predict a carbon price and factor it in. And if it gets too volatile, it becomes too uncertain and too risky. So there's a coalition of polluters like uh, Woodside, uh, the NFF, the National Farmers Federation, 
the Meat and Livestock Association, project developers, farmers, landowners, and NGOs who have been lobbying um, or working together to develop a super method and then approaching the, uh, the government and Minister Taylor to see if we can't change the way this market has historically been structured to allow, allow for more supply. And I've nearly finished this little success story. One slide to go after this. Currently, under the carbon farming um, uh, structure, only one method and one project are allowed per property. Now, farmers do not run their farms, and some of these are enormous farms, hundreds of thousands of hectares. Some are very small, high-value ag farms. They don't manage their farms by carbon pool. They manage their farm holistically as they go in concern. Um, but at the moment, they only get recognized and awarded for one carbon pool on the property. If all they did was manage livestock, they couldn't get carbon credits for planting trees or managing vegetation or improving soil carbon. If they focused on soil carbon, they couldn't apply for any other benefits, even though they're being achieved. And that prevents people coming to the market because some of these projects are marginal in terms of the costs to deliver versus the revenues you get. But if you can get more revenues, on properties by managing them holistically, then you bring into the market more supply, more landowners, and more people benefiting from climate uh, carbon farming in their communities. So the last slide at this stage is the future. We, um, as an industry group, have done a lot of work on predicting how we could uh, improve and what levels of improvement we could get. The numbers on the left show the results to date after 10 years of the carbon farming program. Pretty impressive, but modest. 500 projects, 47 million hectares, which I believe is larger than Germany and getting towards the size of France of land under management. 200 million ACUs, which is 200 million tons of carbon emissions reduced or abated. And revenue flowing to regional communities and landowners are about 2.6 uh, billion. Now, let me just check something, sorry. Um, where we think we can get to in the next five years, 10 years rather, we can bring in over 5,000 new projects. So multiplying the number of landholders who take part in the scheme tenfold. And even then, given there are 80,000 farms or more in Australia, we still haven't touched the size of what's possible. We'd increase the land under management to 65 million hectares, which is extraordinarily huge. In the bushfires in 2020, I think we lost eight to 10 million hectares of land through bushfires, the most devastating bushfires in our history. We can re reproduce six times that land area, farming the, the land differently to reduce emissions. And the key point here is two and a half billion ACUs. Now, each ACU is a ton of carbon. In Australia, we emit half a billion tons each year. So on average for the next decade, the carbon farming sector alone can re reduce emissions by an amount equal to 50% of our annual emissions. That's the potential of the land sector if it's managed correctly. Uh, and that could bring in as much as $50 billion or more into rural and regional communities. Some of our projects we run with <clears throat> traditional owners and um, they, for the first time in their history, have got 10 year line of sight to predictable revenue to build social governance, corporate governance, infrastructure, to employ trainee rangers to do fire burning on the projects. The certainty these things provide to TOs alone is worth the effort. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little bit- oh, That's uh, that's nervous. that's fabulous. We, that, thank you so much. We've deep dived into a, um, a, a very optimistic and, and um, hopeful- um... <laughs> and, and possible. Plausible. And, and possible, yes. Demonstration of what's possible when the market has clear signals. And um, I, it feels like climate entrepreneurs in the private sector have been um, just trying to operate with the brakes on or with one hand tied behind their back. So I just want to come to a couple of a couple of questions. Um, I'm assuming that the question that Ian's posed, um, are we not too late for this option? Ian's suggesting that our rapidly deteriorating climate means that we we can't do do this. I, I would say that you've just answered that. It is still possible. It's not too late. Um, but I, I take your point, Ian, that you're, you were concerned that the, the, the land wouldn't be able to sustain these sort of projects. Um, can, I, can I safely say, Freddie, that that's, that's not an issue? We're not too late for this. It, it, it's happening and we can I, I wouldn't be complacent. We're, we're, we're going right. to suffer and are suffering and have suffered uh, physical damage from climate change. And a lot of that will be effectively permanent given human life cycles. 
Um, we're not going to get out of this scot-free. Ian's absolutely right. The pressure is to act now. It was to yeah. act yesterday, in fact. The point being that when it's done properly, as in the land sector in Australia, and you get both sides of the equation working together, you can do it. But you need that policy drive and energy, which we sorely lack in Australia. Mm, yeah, thank you. Look, I want to cross to Nicolette Boyle, who has uh, some experience in this sector and has a question for you. Have you, Nicolette? I do, Freddie. <laughs> really lovely to see you. Great presentation, and I'm glad we did it that way around because, yes, Ian did a dark truth telling and <laughs> Freddie gave us some, some hope. I think my question is probably quite similar to the one that Martin has put in the chat here, which is um, like when we think about taking care of resources at home, we do that. Um, what do we do? We, re we reduce, reuse, and we recycle. And in the sort of a similar way, when we do with um, tackling greenhouse emissions, we want to save, so save energy and not use it in the first place, be efficient. We want to switch from the really heavy carbon polluting um, sources to the renewable ones. And then as a last measure in terms of um, sort of in the integrity of these solutions for the climate, we want to sequester. Now, Freddie, the solution that you've put forward tonight is fantastic. I am um, um, when I retire in uh, hopefully you know in a, maybe a few decades time. I want to radically be part of this movement of um, of restoring the landscape. I think it's got great potential, and there's just you know co benefits all round. I, what I think um, the question to you is: to what extent is it dangerous to? have a solution which look, doesn't deal with, for example, the 17% of methane emissions that come out of the front of cows, mm -hmm. um, which are very much part of our landscape. And um, by selling your solution, are we di distracting people from the real causes of this, which is keeping fossil fuels in the ground where they need to stay? It's, it's a perfectly valid um, observation, Nick, and it's been leveled at the carbon markets globally for you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years. So we need to be very, very clear. And you, lined, you, you summed it up very nicely in your question. But, um, we need to reduce emissions at source. We need to switch to clean energy. And the emissions we can't reduce or can't reduce quickly enough, we can then offset. For me, the potential of the land sector is to take us down below net zero to negative. If it's simply used as a cover to keep polluting, it's fundamentally wrong. And that is why the policy settings are so important. This can't be seen uh, as a smoke screen, as Ian put it, or a cover to keep on going business as usual. It's a critical part of the solution. It's by no means the only part, and it should not be allowed uh, as, a, as an excuse to keep burning fossil fuels. So totally on board with you there. And the answer to that, in my mind, is the rigor of the policy settings. You just prevent that happening. You insist that industry and manufacturing reduce emissions at source. Thank you, Nicolette, for that question, and Freddie, that 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 that's great um, fleshing out our understanding of those those different areas of this. <clears throat> and I just want to come back to the market. We talked about um, let's follow the money. Can Ian? Can I come back to you for this one? Just uh, to start with, speak to us about the money that's holding the status quo in place now. Um, and you know, we're getting a sense of where the smart money's been quietly moving. But, but just more broadly, where, where, is, where are these vast tranches of money and therefore opportunity um, uh, showing up? And, and so if we're not on board with this, what, what opportunity costs are we as Australians missing out on? Well, I think if you look at the discussions in Glasgow at the moment, um, <clears throat> last week, uh, Mark Carney, the previous head of the Bank of England, announced a sort of accumulation of uh, investment funds all around the world. I've forgotten the exact numbers, but they're now talking about trillions of dollars be becoming available for all the sort of things that Freddie's talking about. Um, now that's all that's all fine, but the fact is that so far it's not happening anywhere near fast enough. And a lot of those funds that are talking about um, making those investments, if you actually scratch their bank balance sheets, you find there's still a hell of a lot of money going into fossil fuels. And if you look at the um, actual position of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, uh, we've had various attempts to say in the G20 and the G7 that we're going to get rid of them all. 
but nothing happens. And the IMF's figures, which were updated, I think, earlier this year, actually, um, demonstrate that there's still about $5.6 trillion a year in effective subsidy going to the fossil fuel industry because of the fact that we don't price carbon properly in the way that, you know, Freddie's talking about. I mean, you know, we, we are paying for that ourselves in terms of the cost of bushfires, the insurance costs we cover, all the health, the health costs that are not, you know, accounted for by the fossil fuel producers themselves. Now, if you look at Australia, I mean, the, the, the IMF figures demonstrate that I think the latest number is about $63 billion equivalent uh, if you add up the uh, climate change effects to, is the amount we're, we're subsidizing the fossil fuel industry by. And it's vastly more than we spend on defense. And this is not talked about. I mean, you know, carbon pricing is not a tax. It is removal of a subsidy. And Tony Abbott got away with this many years ago, and the media have never let him, you know, never ever questioned it. So we've got to start to talk honestly about this. We've also need to see uh, much greater levels of uh, honesty coming out of the investment community, uh, that if they're going to do all this stuff, they also have to cut off the funding going into the fossil fuel industry itself. Now, it's starting to happen, but it's taking far too long. And I know there are all sorts of arguments about you can't things along too quickly because you'll disrupt the market and so on and so forth. But the fact is that the market so far has not demonstrated on an unregulated basis that it's actually capable of handling the problem it's created. So there needs to be regulation. Um, some of the things Freddie mentioned, I think, are very appropriate. I mean, you look at the way carbon farming operates and the example I think Freddie gave of the farm. Now, you can't, what we need is a whole of nation approach to uh, optimizing policy to ensure that we get the best possible results out of all the initiatives that are being taken. I mean, there isn't any silver bullet to any of this. There's going to be a whole lot of things that contribute to getting on top of the problem. Carbon farming is one of them. Um, but you've got to use the best possible uh, framework of regulation to allow it to generate the maximum returns. And that's what we're not doing. I mean, if we keep on pretending fossil fuels can continue forever and a day and we'll offset the effect of that, then we're not going to get on top of this problem. You don't reduce emissions by increasing them massively and then trying to offset them with technologies that don't yet exist. <laughs> That's a very good summary, that last sentence, honestly. Uh, I think most of us are despairing. Um, <clears throat> folks, I'd be happy to take questions in the um, chat. And while, while they come in, and, and some have been coming in, I think we've addressed most of them. Um, I, I just want to pose a personal question to both of you. In terms of your road to Damascus sort of transition from, from working in the coal industry or, or mining and, and, then, and then having that revelatory moment or, or, or moments, I don't know, did it come slowly, quickly? I, I've got to keep this short, but I, I'm, I'm asking this because I'm curious about the folks who are running the companies now that, that keep demanding um, finance or, 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 you know, there are individuals at the, at the, at the, who run all of the companies that we're trying to stop doing what they do. Is, is there scope for um, speaking to those individuals as human beings? And, and having that don't you have children, don't you have grandchildren conversation. So Ian and Freddie, just briefly, how did your shift come about in, in mindset? Well, I'll go first if you like, Freddie. I mean, this has been a long term thing. In the days I was in the fossil fuel industry, um, you got your salary, you did your job and um, you got on with life. Uh, as time's gone on, I mean, I was involved in a lot of long-term energy planning issues and um, risk exposure and so on, and it concentrates the mind. As time's gone on, um, the science on climate change has got clearer and clearer. It was pretty clear in the 1960s. Um, the evidence has got clearer and clearer in terms of the impacts, and there comes a point where you have to do something about it, and I guess I reached that point at the end of the 80s. Um, but what changed in the 90s was the way we actually pay people. We started paying people bonuses. 
before that you got your salary and you were very happy with that and off you went and did your job. In the middle of the 90s, we started paying bonuses, which changed, in my view, the entire ethical basis of business from one which looked at the long term. And uh, I think it's probably fair to say you have statesmen running companies much more so than today when they looked at the benefits to society. Uh, now, as that remuneration focus has changed, we started in the US with the the uh, free market paradigms and so on, Milton Friedman and uh, the whole crew. Then you have found that people became more and more short term focused. They really had little interest in the long term. And as Upton Sinclair said long ago, if my salary depends on doing a certain thing, it's very difficult to get people to undo it. So, you know, that has become a dominant paradigm. And I think it's very unfortunate. I think it has changed a lot of things. It's made denial um, much more a fundamental element of something like climate change, where it has the potential to completely alter uh, our future. And nobody wants to accept that because the past has been very uh, beneficial. So most people are now in the position of basically uh, protecting the past from the future rather than the reverse. And that is still a very big problem. Now, it's, it's why we've had all the denial we've had, and I think um, we're finally starting to break it, but it's still going to be difficult to really see those barriers push right aside. Thanks, Ian. Freddie. Yes, um, I think my journey was very similar to Ian's. The um, reality of climate change science and the impossibility of continuing to burn fossil fuels at the rates we were then burning them 30 years ago, 20 years ago, which have now exceeded uh, massively, was blindingly obvious. I, I suspect that there's a few factors at play here. Um, to your question, what would you say to the executives of all companies? I think it may be too late. Um, just so there are tipping points in the climate uh, when things accelerate in a relatively uncontrolled manner. I think there are tipping points in industries, and we've seen industries come and industries go. And right now, I think there's a squeeze going on on fossil fuel companies, not uniformly, not in every country or jurisdiction, but financiers and providers of capital are getting very uncomfortable with the risks those assets represent and the enormous risks of stranded assets. Um, and most companies now are under enormous pressure to either demonstrate a viable transition strategy to a sustainable business model, or impossibly hard, I suspect, demonstrate a credible case as to why your business is exempt from the risks of being an um, energy emissions intensive company. And there isn't much time for them left to act. Uh, and the last thing they want to be uh, happen to them is to be caught in that sort of valley of death where they suddenly realize, oh my God, we need to transition. And the capital goes, you're on your own and then the company dies. I think we'll see tipping points like that. I honestly don't have, I think you're, probably, you're a psychologist, I think Samantha, or a psychiatrist, so you'll have a better view how to communicate to people the existential threat they're causing themselves. But if they've not seen the light thus far, they're not going to see the light before the light gets turned off, if I can mix my metaphors. So I think there are circumstances beyond the control of any one CEO or any one company. Demand is going to change dramatically the cost of capital, the cost of insurance, the yeah. appetite for their products. And they'll be caught up in that. And they'll either have planned a transition out or they won't survive. Oh, yes, I did have a bit more faith in human, <clears throat> I don't know, the, the ability for humans to wake up. And um, <clears throat> I, just, to, just to set you straight, my PhD was in corporate sustainability, not so much um, psychology, oh, but it, it's sort of in, you know, inextricably linked. Um, <clears throat> My goodness, I'm reading some of the the, um, the chat here. Um, can we put to bed, please, thoroughly, the argument that um, <clears throat> that uh, other countries aren't doing enough, so aren't we doomed anyway? Why bother? What's 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 your best answer to that one, gentlemen? Well, I, I mean, people say a lot about China, and China's not doing enough. China is doing one hell of a lot more than we are. They're leading the world in renewable technology. They are the biggest solar producers, the biggest wind farm producers. Yes, they have a problem in terms of cutting back on their coal consumption, 
but you have to remember that the reason that it went it doubled from two, uh, 2000 to about 2012, from two to four billion tons, was largely because we sent all of our manufacturing industries to China. And Australia benefited to a very great extent because we supplied the coal to allow that to happen and the iron ore. So um, there is a major issue of global equality in, in this debate, which we probably don't have time to get into tonight. But it's going to become an even bigger issue because we do have to recognise that our per capita consumption is up at the 14, I think, tonnes it is uh, annually. Uh, China's is about seven. India is about uh, less than four, and in Africa, it's about two. I mean, you know, the rest of the world has got to be able to grow to raise living standards. Our living standards don't necessarily have to drop, but our consumption certainly does. And we, we have to be smart about how we do it. It's not sackcloth and ashes, but it does mean we have to look at much greater societal change than anybody's even mentioning here. I mean, you don't see that even come in, it's not, there's not a single word in the plan, the Australian way to actually address those things. So we need, you know, we've got a much, much broader conversation to take place here if we're gonna get on top of this problem. Sure, I, I'd echo everything here said, and I, I'd add a couple of things that um, there's an obligation upon the countries who have been most of it for most long and whose wealth has been built upon access to cheap fossil fuel energy to take a leadership position on this. As Ian said, we've outsourced manufacturing and the liability for the pollution that causes to developing countries in our own interests. So um, just as we take leadership positions and lead by example, every time a developed country like Australia acts as a laggard, that gives room for Russia and Brazil and other countries to go, well, they're not doing it, we're not doing it. We have an obligation to show leadership in this. We can afford it. We are the richest countries in the world. We live like kings and queens of yesteryear. We are so affluent. And if we, uh, we can afford it, and we must afford it. And again, not everything is a cost. These are investments in a clean or zero carbon future, which unleashes in its own way economic benefits. But we just need to be clear and certain and focused. And please, dear God, have leadership from the top down. That understands that. Yeah, look that, sorry, go on in and then. Just one other thing that people forget is we've also got <clears throat> probably the greatest uh, potential of renewable energy in this country or anywhere in the world. And we're not using it yet. And if you look at a country like China and India, they start to say, well, what the hell's going on here? I mean, these guys have got all these resources. They're not using them. What they're doing is in fact using up the old style resources and making our life even worse. Now, uh, I mean, now that's in a geopolitical sense, that is going to become an increasing issue. And it's not just going to be in terms of carbon pricing at the boundaries of, you know, different states. It's going to become much more fundamental than that in terms of geopolitical uh, positioning. Mm. It's mm. also true, Sam, just one last comment, um, that in many cases, the private sector is leading the public sector, i.e. politicians by a country mile. Um, in Australia, there are numerous examples. The Sun Cable project up at the top end, providing solar power through a DC cable to Singapore. So it was obviously an energy, but basically we're bottling up Australian solar resources. Um, you know, for Fortescue Future Industries, the, uh, the um, Andrew Forrest's investments in clean hydrogen, now they're taking the risk by going well ahead of policy. There's no, at, at the national level in Australia, as we know, there's no clear climate change uh, policy, but these guys can see the writing on the wall. And it was in 2012, in fact, looking back historically, that for the first time um, on the planet, we spent more money on renewables and on fossil fuel investments, more capital went into renewables. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way for 12, uh, sorry, eight or nine years. So without policy, uh, capital eventually finds a level that you can manage the risks. But there's so many areas that it won't go into until there's clear policy guidelines and rules and, and, and consistency, which we need to open up very, very quickly. So you know, yeah. money will find its level, but we need to give it a push in the right direction and make sure it's going where it needs to go at the pace it needs to go. Yeah, yeah. And so in order to, uh, I think we, we should, let's segue into, uh, given it's, it's nearly half past the hour, 
the what what are we here for everything that we've just heard that was an absolutely magnificent um summary of the the opportunities and the risks uh that, that are confronting us and what can we here as voices of bradfield do um i've got a, a question here you referred to um freddie you know independence of the way forward why would you why would we not vote for green or, or a labor candidate they're established, they know the ropes. What are we going to get if we if we vote independent? Sure. Um, without giving away too much of my political proclivities, um, I'd like to vote for a Green candidate, but that's pointless up here because we'll never get elected. So we need to have, um, in the Bradfield alone, we really do need to have a progressive liberal, smaller liberal, I think is the best way I would describe that. Someone who understands and is disappointed, to put it politely, with the lack of progress on climate change and corruption and compassion and the other key points of the platform. Um, and the reason independents are the solution, I think, at least in the short term, or well, maybe major policy platforms get realigned in the major parties, is um, they can focus on issues that are important to their electorate, and they're not beholden to a party line. And in effect, they have a conscience vote on every issue that comes before them. And with the leverage they have, small numbers with the guns of power in the lower house uh, have enormous leverage to insist upon climate change. If you think back to the Gillard government, um, the common view of the policy platform she put forward with the Greens, that it was an excellent policy platform. It didn't suit other uh, politicians, which is their right. But at the time, it was an excellent balanced policy platform put through by a minority government, in that case, having to work with the Greens. Now, if there were more progressive centrists in, as independents in the lower house, I think we get a very well nuanced, balanced, but aggressive climate change policy, more likely than not. And if those independents of our independent, whoever he or she might be, um, lays out their wares and says, well, I'm after this and I'll, I'll be prepared to do that, find common ground with other independents so you have a platform that you can all stand behind and then frankly negotiate with who the hell you have to negotiate with. Do a deal with the devil if a deal's there to be done, but get it done. And you're not mm. beholden to a party line or to a platform. Mm. Yep, yep. Thanks for that. It, it, look, Ian, would you like to have the, the final word before I, I wrap up and just uh, show people where our website is, our donate button, and um, and next events. Well, th well thank you. And um, I'd just like to reiterate the fact that uh, this is all going to have will far, far faster than we expect. And, um, you know, the, you, what we're seeing is the beginnings of a process that move, is moving away now from a time where we thought we had the chance to make an orderly transition through to a low carbon world. Uh, that's too late now. We've left it too long. We are now going to move into a disruptive process. You started to see that in the events occurring in Europe uh, with increased gas prices. Uh, you're seeing it in China with increased coal prices because the um, the contradiction between continuing growth and energy supply and so on is popping up in all sorts of different places. Um, the immediate response to that is to say, well, we've got to slow things down. We actually have to do quite the reverse. We really have to speed them up mm -hmm. because the opportunities are there, as Freddie said. Um, the technologies are essentially there to do it. We really now need a maximum push from communities to uh, reinforce the fact these things have to be accelerated and constructively. I mean, not just in the you know toxic environment we've had before, but in, in everybody's common interest. It's now essential we get that discussion going on the size of, and speed of the change required, and we all get behind making that occur. There, there are going to be a whole lot of hiccups along the way. There's no question about that. Um, but the implications of slowing it down and not doing it are going to be far, far worse. Mm. But the solutions are essentially there, and we uh, we just had to cross the threshold and get on with it. And there we go. That's a great positive note. Yeah. <laughs> I missed that last bit. I cut. What was the last sentence, Ian? I said we just have to get on with it and get out of the way. Get people out of the way who are not prepared to do it. That's it. That's it. And I was just highlighting the positivity with which with which. Uh, 
that that can um can can be interpreted so voices of bradfield is is that organization that is wanting to accelerate the change in the positive um we have as i summarized at the beginning we've we've made so much progress and we've only been going six months um so we would really uh value your um your your membership your participation uh your your donations whatever it is in whatever way that you can contribute to us we are um we're we're gunning for this this next election uh, we're pretty pleased with where we're at in our um, candidate selection process there'll be more on that in the coming weeks and just to to wrap up thank you so much freddie sharp and ian dunlop really appreciate your time your expertise and your just the, the, the felt sense of your presence. Yeah, un, unmute yourselves, folks, if you'd like to, and just um, thank Ian and Freddie. Thank you. Yeah, really. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you indeed. And um, we'll put the um, anything that we've referred to in, uh, in the conversation in an email to you all. And um, uh, events are coming up. They're on the, they're on the website. More face-to-face -face stuff is being planned. And so the team, not, not me because I'm here in Scotland, but the rest of them would love to see you face to face um, to, to plot our next steps. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, everyone.